Good evening, church. My name is Bob Gibson. It's my privilege to serve you and all of our Woodman Valley campuses as one of your elders. I was asked this evening a couple of weeks ago by both pastors Matt and Josh as a 28-year military veteran to remind all of us of the real meaning of Memorial Day because we all too often think of it as just another three-day weekend. I was made mindful of the real meaning of Memorial Day many years ago when stationed here as a young Air Force captain at Peterson Air Force Base. I was on the Inspector General team. And the IG team's mission was to conduct no-notice operational readiness inspections for our nuclear missile bases to ensure they are always up to snuff for their nuclear deterrent and nuclear retaliatory capabilities as needed. The IG team was about 120 people. It was divided into four flights, operations, maintenance, logistics, and support. Every one of those flights was led by a young Air Force captain. The IG team itself was commanded by a colonel. At that time, it was Colonel Judd Blaisdell, who was and continued to be a mentor to me throughout my military career. Throughout the year, Colonel Blaisdell would have something called commander's calls, where he would gather the entire team together to talk about upcoming nuclear inspections, previous inspections, and also get feedback to and from directly with the people on the team. There's one particular commander's call where the boss asked for feedback, and a young captain stood up and said, Sir, we've been traveling a lot. We have more inspections coming up this summer. I would ask before this upcoming three-day weekend that our team members would have the privilege of wearing their civilian clothes to work that day and not the military uniform. It was at that time three things happened in the room. First, it got very quiet. Secondly, a senior NCO sitting next to me stared at the floor and shook his head. The backbone of the U.S. military, the senior NCOs. And finally, after what seemed like an eternity of staring at the captain, Colonel Blaisdell said, young captain and everyone else in this room, I hope what I'm about to tell you, you'll never forget. Throughout the history of our nation, men and women have found it a privilege to wear that uniform, to fight in that uniform, to bleed in that uniform, and have so called upon to die in that uniform. If at any time, young captain, you no longer find it a privilege to wear that uniform, you let me know, and I'll do everything in my power vested as a colonel in the United States Air Force to make sure you never wear that uniform again. That, ladies and gentlemen, was the end of a commander's call, April 1995. <clears throat> and I'm convinced to this day Many years later, there was more than just one person in that room who remembered the real meaning of Memorial Day. As my career unfolded, and now as a military veteran, I have friends that wore the uniform, fought the uniform, and they never came home. As John tells us in his gospel, chapter 15, greater love has no man than this, other than he who is willing to lay down his life for his friends. So I would ask all of us this Memorial Day weekend to reflect on the real meaning of the day. In just a few moments, you're about to see over 100 names on the screen of those men and women that paid the ultimate price for our nation's freedom. May we never forget them. I also have a very special, solemn request, as I have lost friends in service to our country. I would ask all of you in the congregation this evening who have lost friends, colleagues, associates, neighbors, or dare I say family members, when these names are on the screen, to stand solemnly with me in memorial to them. Let us never, ever forget. If you would please publish the names.
Church, my name is Brent. I'm one of the worship leaders here, and we're thankful that you've joined us. Um, it's a powerful thing to be able to honor those that have sacrificed their lives for our freedoms. And as we continue in this time, we want to acknowledge the one who has sacrificed for our ultimate freedom and lift his name high. And so we're going to sing some songs together. But in Matthew uh, 18, he says that when two or more are gathered in his name, he is present with us. So if you stand with me, if you would stand with me, I'm going to say a prayer, welcome him here, and just ask that he would be with us in our time of worship. Let's pray together. Dear Jesus, we love you and we thank you for all that you've done. And as we, as we remember the sacrifice that these names that were listed on the screen, that they have made for our freedoms, even more so, we want to celebrate tonight the sacrifice you've made for each of our freedoms, for our eternal freedom. And so, Lord, we pray that you would move in this time. We pray that you would undistract our hearts. You know how our minds can work, and we may have thoughts of the past week or um, just concerns that we have or what's on our schedule in the coming week. But, Lord, we pray that you would focus our hearts in this time, and may we bring you glory May we bring you honor. May we sing of your faithfulness. Remind our hearts of that truth. Lord, may your spirit move in this place tonight. And may we have a greater understanding of the love you have for us. Be with us now. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's worship together. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaken, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus, cause he's never let me down. He's faithful
reading in my devotional this week and I came across this verse and I just wanted to read it out for us during this worship service. It's from Ephesians 3 verses 18 and 19. It says this, and I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, how long, how high and how deep is the love of Christ. And to know that this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with the measure of all the fullness of God. I pray that we would know this truth, that each time we sing these songs, we're, rem we're reminded of the depth of his love for us. So let's sing that truth and continue to worship. You met me at my lowest moment. And you saw me at my very When I expected disappointment, love was all I heard. My sin was deep, your grace was deeper, my shame was wide, 
Jesus, the truth in these words, may we never forget that truth. Your love is far greater than our sin, our regret, our shame, our mistakes. Your love goes beyond all of those and you're always running towards us. You're always running after us. And so for that, we thank you. Lord, I pray that you remind us daily of that truth. And as we continue in this service, I pray that we would have a greater understanding of that love in our lives. Lord, as we offer up this offering, Lord, it's just another way of us worshiping you. It's giving back what was yours in the first place. But as we do that, we partner with you in your work. We partner with you as you minister to the city. Lord, use these gifts to reach the people that need
need to be reached. Lord, continue to be with us in this time, in this service. We love you and we are so thankful for all that you've given to each one of us. In your name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Thinking about the foundations that we lay in those early years, how did you or how are you kind of shaping the foundation and shaping it around biblical truth and values? Our, ch our children are in the young foundational years right now, and so we're in the, in the thick of it, but one of the ways that we're trying to really teach our children, you know, some of those biblical truths are just, especially in love, right? Like, hey, God loves you. I love you. Mom loves you. Um, and really focusing on, on how their actions maybe are not in line with that love, right? Like, hey, you know, you don't want to hurt mom, do you, right? Like, when you do this, that, that hurts mom. Loving is so important in the relationship that we have. We just want them to know that they are loved, but also trying to bring them closer to that love in their own actions as well. I think shaping the foundation, um, especially when they're so young, uh, needs to center on, like Tim and Noel were saying, the very simple, simple truth. Um, Jesus summed up the entire Bible in love God and love people. That one has to be rock solid as soon as possible. And they can understand it so, so early. And they understand it in the way that we love them. And we model that love for them um, in the way that we live life. Well, hello, Woodman. It's good to see all of you here at Woodman Heights and a special warm welcome to those of you at our other campuses watching online. Man, we are just glad that you are with us today. Well, my name is Kurt, one of the pastors here at Woodman, and, and we are continuing our series in parentology. And, and I do have to start with a big disclaimer. Josh has been doing this, so I'll do it as well. Um, I feel oftentimes more like a failure than a success as a parent. And so a lot of what we're going to look at today um, is a lot of it born out of some of those stumbles that we've had along the way, as well as some successes. And so I just don't want anybody to feel like, gosh, this is a guy who clearly has it all figured out with his kids. I want to start, though, with a question, and I wonder if any of you who have, have kids, if you've ever put them through or are they currently in braces, raise your hand if you've, if you've gone through that with your kids. Yeah, so we, we had six kids, five of them needed to go through braces. So if you are an orthodontist, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah, we, we did braces, and you know, as I was thinking about braces, I thought, well, if we've had our kids, I figured somewhere in like 10 years total worth of braces for our kids, so I'm at least going to get one sermon illustration out of it. So here it goes. So braces, right, the, the orthodontist notices there's some things with your, your kid's teeth, whether it's teeth or their bite, their jaw, things aren't quite lined up. So they put a plan together on how they're going to correct it. And then as you guys are probably aware, there's an awful lot of mechanics that go into it. There's braces and bands and rubber bands and springs and headgear. Man, there's a ton of stuff that they do to, to try to get those teeth back into alignment. And it's, it's not easy. It takes a lot of time. It takes discipline. It can be painful if you've got braces on because your teeth feel loose and, and they're sore after they get adjusted. And so it takes some time. But then eventually... Whether it's a year, two years, three years, those braces come off. You get to rub your tongue against your smooth teeth for the first time. You look in the mirror, and man, it's a great smile. But you're not done. You're not done because you're supposed to continue to wear your retainer because your teeth want to naturally kind of drift back out of place and, and, and get misaligned. And so you're supposed to wear your retainer. Now, I, I tell you, I wish that was the most difficult training that you would have to do with your kids for parents. But it's not. Right? Parenting is about trying to get your kids aligned with the things that are of God, and it's difficult to do. We naturally kind of drift in and out of that, and it can take hard work, discipline, diligence, and sometimes it can be painful. And so today, we're, we're going to look at this idea of training up our kids. And, and I know for most all, I, I don't know that I've ever met, actually, a Christian parent who their biggest goal for their kids is not that they want their kids to know Jesus Christ, to have saving faith in Jesus, and to live lives that honor him. Everything else, careers, whatever that might be, everything else is gravy. That's the most important thing we want for our kids. 
But training up our kids to follow Jesus can be really, really challenging. Especially when we live in a world and live in a culture that seems to value things that are directly opposed to the things of God. And so I want to encourage you, those of you who have children in the home, this is the time. This is the best opportunity that you have to instill a way of life that honors God to your kids. And so as we've been doing throughout this series, we're going to dive into God's word and apply it to parenting. And and today we're going to be in the book of Colossians. And Paul is writing to the church in Colossae, and and, and it's kind of like his spiritual children. It's a new church, and he's writing to them. And and in our text today, there's three things that he wants them to remember. He wants them to hold fast to their identity in Christ, to remember their core of who they are. And then he wants them not to be taken captive by the way of the world, but rather he wants them to choose behaviors and exhibit behaviors that reflect their identity in Christ. In short, he wants to strengthen their spiritual core. I think it's a great message for all of us that follow Jesus, whether you're a parent or not. But we'll try, I'll try to make it especially applicable to our parents. So let me pray, and then we're going to jump into the book of Colossians. Father God, I first just want to praise you and thank you for the gift of your word. Lord, that you, the sovereign God of the universe, have chosen to reveal yourself through the pages of scripture. And so, Father, as we open it up, as we look at it today, I just would would pray that your Holy Spirit would be present. You'd be working in our hearts and our minds. Open, Open us up to those messages that you have right for us. And, Father, I just pray for myself that you would be at work, even if I bumble or stumble with my words. Father, I just pray that your message would go forward. We lift up all of these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. So we will be in the book of Colossians. Colossians 3, and as I mentioned, this is a, a letter that Paul wrote to the church at Colossae. And it's interesting that what we know about that city is, is they had what we call syncretism. So they had a variety of different belief systems and religions that were there. There was Judaism, there was this fledgling new thing of Christianity, and there was a lot of pagan beliefs. And so what was happening in this city is people were picking and choosing from all these different religions and creating one that just fit them. Taking the things that worked, the things that they liked, and they were creating their own religion. I don't think it's too distant from what we see in our own culture today. And a challenge for many of us that follow Christ, it can be easy to start pulling in things of the culture and weaving them in to our faith. There were so many differing and, and competing beliefs vying for their attention. Paul wants the Colossians to remember the core, the most important things. And as parents, I think it's good for us to listen in on this letter and see how we might take those things that were meant for that church and apply them in our own households. So we're going to start in Colossians 3 with the first verse. And, and Paul is imploring them to remember their core, remember their identity. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. That is where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things of earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. You might notice that this starts with the words, if, then. So it's pretty clear that Paul has been building a case throughout his letter, and, and now he's, he's talking about these specific areas of your identity in Christ. And so far, Paul has reminded them that because they have received Christ, they have been raised with him, and so they should not be taken captive by the things of the world. Followers of Christ, in short, should be different on the outside because we are redeemed on the inside. And so Paul tells them, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Seated at the right hand of God might be helpful for us to think about that in in legal terms. And we've got God as the, the just and holy and perfect judge. And you and I are on trial. And we have an accuser. Satan is accusing and bringing to mind all of the the mistakes, the sins that we have done, and and Satan is just bombarding us with this account. But the great news is that our defense attorney is none other than Jesus himself. Not only does he know the law really well, he actually wrote it. He fulfilled it. And so the beauty is that what we're seeing here is that while we might be on that judgment seat facing God, our defense attorney, Jesus himself, is vouching for us, saying, these are my people. They are forgiven. They are redeemed. I have paid the penalty for them. And so we can have a right standing before 
our just Lord. In fact, in 1 John 1, 9, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Paul starts by reminding the Colossians that our identity is found in Christ. Not by any accomplishments, not by the things that we do. Those aren't what define our identity. It's our standing in Christ. Because of that, he says in verse 2, set your mind on the things that are above, not the things of earth. Paul, Paul here is showing us that there's a, there's a fork in the road. There's a fork in the road in the way that we go, and one way leads to life, and that's following the things that are of the Lord, or we can go the other way, and we can follow what the world says is important. We can place our identity and our position in Christ. We can place our identity in what the world says is valuable. In fact, Paul says this twice. Once in verse 1, he says, seek the things that are above. And then in verse 2, he says, set your mind on the things that are above. Two different words with, I think, two different meanings. Seek the things that are above. Desire them. Pursue them. Chase after them. This is an active all-of-life pursuit to go after the things of God. He's not talking about squeezing them into our busy life. Paul's not giving us a checklist that we can just check off and we're done. This is an all-of-life pursuit of the things of God. We are to seek the things that are above. And then in verse 2, he restates it, but he says, set your mind on the things that are above. Make a choice, make a willful decision to follow after and to set your mind on the things that are of God. Study and meditate on his word. Seek after and live out his wisdom. Paul's calling us to align our hearts and our minds on the things that are of Christ. Now, parents, we, we can't actively control whether or not our kids will place their saving faith in Jesus. But we can help form the right identity by actively seeking the things of God. We can reinforce those things in their lives. Verse 3, Paul continues, For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also appear with him in glory. That old person is dead, has died, and we are hidden. Hidden here is not secretive, but, but means that, that we are protected, that we are assured of our life in Christ. If you are a follower of Jesus, then you are destined for an eternity in his presence. The, the war is over. Victory is won. Paul realizes that our identity in Christ is foundational to building a strong spiritual core. Who we are, what we believe about ourselves, will guide how we live our lives. And that seems pretty simple. And as parents, again, we want to instill a desire for our kids. And we want to instill this Christ-centered identity rather than a worldly one. But don't underestimate the pull of the world in our own lives. These two paths, this path on one that follow God that leads to life, and then this other one, this dark one that leads to death, seems like an easy fork in the road. But while we may want to go down this path that leads to God, I think there are often times when we start to hear and see things on this other path, and maybe we start to drift. And a small drift early on over the course of a lifetime will take us drastically off course. You know, one of these areas where our, our desire as parents to pursue the godly path, but, but we got kind of sucked into some of the worldly things. It was with my oldest son. And when I'm a baseball fan, love baseball. I've played it my whole life. And, and when he was a young guy, he loved to play it too. And, and when he started to play t-ball, and I was his coach, I tell you, he was such a great t-ball player. I thought, I've got the next MVP of the major leagues right here in my family. And so that started for us, this, this pursuit of baseball, and it was so much a part of his life. We, we played all the time. We practiced. We played games. We would go to camps and clinics, find people to help develop his skills. And, and then as he got older, we had to get on the right teams and the right travel teams, and we would go to showcases so that he could get noticed. And, and we were thinking on the short end, at least he would get a college scholarship. But to be honest, in the back of my mind, I was thinking much larger. And maybe you can't relate to baseball. Maybe for your kids it's theater, it's band, it's karate, it's academics, it's basketball. Whatever it is, it's some of those activities. And they're not bad, right? Those things, those skills that we see in our kids, and we want to develop them in our kids. But I wonder in our zeal to support our kids in these pursuits, are we focusing on the wrong things? Are we drifting off course? Are we sending a message to our kids that their identity is actually not wrapped up in Christ, it's wrapped up in their performance? on whatever their skill is. 
In the case of my son, to be honest, I had a bit of a panic when he was wrapping up high school and we were starting to look at colleges and he made the decision that he didn't want to continue to play baseball into college. And I was actually fine with that, but I was scared to death that he didn't know who he was outside of baseball. I was scared to death that we had spent so much time in baseball, so much of his life had been around his performance in baseball, that he thought all he was was what he performed on the field. I tell you, praise God, and I'm happy to report that he's just fine. He's walking with the Lord, and he actually made that transition pretty smoothly. He knew what his true core was, that his identity was in Christ, not in baseball. How horrible would it be if our kids reached the most loftiest of goals for these activities that they have, and yet they don't know Christ? So I implore you to be careful and avoid being held captive by the things of the world and our culture, maybe even our own egos, the things that they tell us are important. Remember that any good thing, when it becomes the ultimate thing, becomes an idolatrous thing. And so parents, I implore you to stay on course. Don't be distracted from the things that matter most. Let's help our kids clearly see that their identity is in Christ and not of the things of the world. Well, it sounds pretty good, but how do we actually do it? And that's what Paul turns his attention to next. And he's got two different lists that we're going to look at. One list is about the things that we need to put off. And the other list is about the things that we need to put on, the things that we need to do. So he starts with the things that we need to put off. Look at verse 5. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. So Paul starts here by telling them the things to put off or to put to death. And I want to be clear that when we get to lists like this, what what we're not looking at is if you do all of these things, then God will love you or accept you. Now, the follower of Christ seeks to do these things because God has already forgiven us. And we want to live lives that honor and glorify him. So packed into these few verses, Paul actually has two different lists. And he starts by saying, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. I hope you've already picked up that he starts with put to death. He doesn't say stop. He doesn't say avoid. He says put it to death. This stuff is serious. This is deadly serious. These behaviors will lead us away from God and are inconsistent with our call and our identity as Christ followers. Now, now there are different lists like this that that Paul particularly uses throughout Scripture, and so I'm not going to go through everything on this list. Certainly, if you or if your kids are struggling in these areas, we want, to, we want to take care of that. We want to fight against that. But I want to call out one in particular. When he says covetousness, which is idolatry. And, and this idea of covetousness, I think, is born out of self-centeredness. Of the things that I deserve, the things that I want, the things that I should have. And, and we are so self-focused that even if somebody else has something, we want it. And we can't be happy until we have it. And this is a behavior we see at pretty young ages, don't we? If you ever want to do kind of a weird experiment, get two toddlers together and put like a toy right between them and just watch. (laughs) Fighting and grabbing and taking it from each other and wrestling. And you know, with toddlers, it's kind of cute. With grown adults, it's not. This idea that we should just have whatever we want, that the world is all about us, that it's not about others, but it's what I want, what I need. And I'll tell you, as parents, it's a lot easier to train out these behaviors while our kids are young than when they become self-obsessed adults. Putting behaviors to death is strong language. And in verse 6, Paul tells us why he's using such strong language, why he takes these behaviors so seriously. He says, on account of these, the wrath of God is coming. Guys, we serve a loving God. We also serve a just God. And he will not be mocked. There are natural consequences and judgment from the sovereign for these types of activities. He cannot and he will not let sinful behavior go unpunished. And as parents, 
we cannot allow our kids to think that these behaviors are okay. In verse 7, he continues, In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. And here's his second list. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. This, this list starts by describing who we were before Christ. And Paul is telling us that, that we need to stop being influenced by the world because we belong to Christ now. We should be different. We should not conform to the things that the world values or the things we see in the world. His second list here, Paul is focusing on, on how we treat others. And as we look at this list, I'd like to just ask you to consider, are there areas of this list that, that are present in your own family, in your own life, maybe even in the lives of your kids? Are these behaviors that you see at home? And how might, how might outside influences, news, social media, technology, whatever it is, how might these outside influences be shaping you, shaping your family, and shaping your kids? Paul tells them to put away anger. Anger, this deep, smoldering bitterness that seems to come out in every conversation. Put away wrath, violent outbursts. Put away malice, that, that idea that you're, you're sad when somebody else is happy or successful, but you're really happy when somebody else fails. Put away slander, malicious gossip that is meant for nothing other than tearing somebody down. Put away obscene talk, talk that is lewd or indecent. And then Paul talks about lying, that we should not be liars. And, and I think here he's getting back to where is our identity. Because we know Satan is a key deceiver and we know God is actually the embodiment of truth. And so when we lie, we are clearly aligning ourselves and modeling ourselves after Satan and not after God. And so we as Christ followers should be people of truth and integrity. We should be imitators of the God we seek to serve. Now Paul is not simply telling us to stop these behaviors. But I think he's making it clear that these behaviors actually they reveal a deeper heart issue. How we see ourselves, how we see the world around us. You know, when your toddler throws a fit at dinner time, they won't eat their peas, and so they grab that bowl and they fling it across the room to see what will happen. Those times maybe when your son gets skipping class and he decides to lie about it. Those times when your daughter goes on an anger-fueled rant, slandering her teacher, making up all kinds of things to try to make her case against her. Or how about a teenager that gets angry, curses you out, slams the door because you failed to buy them the newest, latest iPhone that everybody else has. Parents, in these situations, when your kids are exhibiting these kinds of behaviors, you need to act. Dr. Dobson, a child and family psychologist, has often said, if your kids come looking for a fight, maybe you need to give it to them. Now, I'm not saying that we should have a contentious home life or that we respond back in kind or with anger towards our kids and full confession. That's an area that I absolutely struggle with, and my kids know it. I have a hard time controlling my own anger when working with them and disciplining them. But Paul is saying, put these behaviors to death. Parents, we cannot be passive. Put to death self-centeredness when you see it in your kids. Put to death anger and malice. Put together, put to death dishonesty. Take these behaviors seriously and take deliberate actions to correct them. Address these behaviors in love early and often. Correct them before they take root and grow in your kids. I would encourage you again, parents, it's not just okay to correct bad behavior. It's your responsibility. Paul has told us the things to put off. And now he's going to tell us the things that we should put on. In verse 10, put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after its image of its creator. Here there is not Greek or Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is in all. And in, but Christ is all and in all. Verse 12, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, 
kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so must you forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything. Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now, that's a pretty packed list. Paul covers a lot of ground in there. And whether Paul was writing this all down himself or whether he had a scribe, you get the sense that he just starts to get on a roll and is just going and that made him think of something else and something else. And so this is really packed full of a lot of different things. And so what I want to do is work through this verse by verse, calling some things out. But for you, it's a lot to take in. So maybe just be focused on one or two items that you think are takeaways that you could bring into your own home. He starts in verse 9 and then verse 10 talking again about lying. And he says, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. This is now the third time in the text we've been looking at that Paul is drawing this distinction, this fork in the road. In verse 1 and 2, he says, we are to seek the things that are above not the things that are on earth. And then again in verse 3, or 4 and 5, excuse me, he says, Christ who is your life, and the way of the world leads to death. And in verses 9 and 10, he's telling us to put off the old self and put on the new self. And Paul here is using language like a change of clothes. Take off your grave clothes and put on your celebration clothes. He's making a very clear choice. We can follow the world and what it values, or we can bear the image of God and reflect him to the world around us. In verse 11, he says, here, and he's talking about the church, the body of Christ. Here, there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Paul talks about some of the things that were dividing the early church. I think it's some of the very same things that divide us today. In the church, there should not be Greek or Jew. Racial or national backgrounds shouldn't matter. They shouldn't divide us. There is not circumcised or uncircumcised. Our our former religious practices and where we came from, those things shouldn't matter. There is not barbarian or Scythian. And Scythian is just like a rude or a crude person or an ignorant person. So some of our cultural differences or how we act or behave, those things shouldn't necessarily separate us. In the church should be those that are both slave and free. We shouldn't divide over our economic or our societal standing. Paul ends it by saying Christ is all and in all. So we should look beyond those things, those earthly things that tend to divide us and fight for unity in the body of Christ. It's fascinating to me that Paul is writing this in his time, and yet again, I think we see so much of that in our own world. So much divisiveness, so much disunity, not only in the world and in the culture, but I think sometimes it can seep into our church. Man, don't let it into your home. Don't retreat back to your tribe, get get suspicious of other people. The, The body of Christ is a beautiful, culturally, ethnic, economically diverse body of Christ. I wonder how well we value those things in our own home. You know, third weekend in January is Martin Luther King weekend, and I think it's a great chance for us as followers of Christ to celebrate a godly man who who certainly was not perfect, but worked his whole life to bring about justice and equality, things that we as Christ followers should be concerned with. It's not an African-American holiday. In many ways, I think it should be a Christian holiday. What are the ways in which you and your own homes can value diversity? Paul continues then with with some of these positive behaviors that we are to put on. In verse 12, he says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, 
Holy and beloved. Holy means set apart. So he's reminding us that we are set apart. We are different. We should be different from the world around us. And, and parents, it's okay if your kids are different than their friends. It's okay if you say we don't do sleepovers on Saturday because we'll miss church on Sunday. It's okay if you set boundaries on what TV shows they watch. Even if they say, well, all of my other friends are watching it, why can't I? It's okay to set some of these boundaries. Explain them to your kids why they're there, that you are protecting them and protecting their heart, that you have a different standard. Followers of Christ are not called to blend in. We're called to be set apart. We're called to be different. Paul continues telling them to put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so must you forgive. You know, I think what's interesting is that Paul's not just lift, listing off a bunch of good qualities that we want to strive for. The, these qualities are actually the antidotes to the negative qualities that he talked about earlier. How do we overcome anger? With compassion. We are to replace wrath with kindness. Meekness and humility put to death malice and self-centeredness. These are two words that I'm not sure we always like, meekness and humility. But really what is intended here is not that you're a doormat, but it's, it's a quiet strength. It's you know that, that you have strength in yourself, but you are still going to willfully choose to put somebody else first. We seek to be patient, long-suffering, to bear with one another. Gosh, I'm not sure how we could be more countercultural than to be long-suffering. To be slow to anger. Slow to speak out. And we should be quick to forgive each other. Not sit back and justify our anger, justify why we're not forgiving somebody. Again, we live in such a contentious culture, and as Christians, way too often we get pulled into it. Way too often we get obsessed with negativity, with name-calling. We explain away our anger, our wrath, our malice as righteous indignation. We're called to a different path. Compassion, kindness, humility, patience, forgiveness. Those are the things we want to instill in our families, instill in our children. And why should we be so quick to forgive? Paul reminds us in verse 13... As the Lord has forgiven you, so must you also forgive. I think for us to really, truly forgive, we've got to come to grips with what Jesus did for us. And if God forgave us from our sin, from our fatal flaw, then how, how could we possibly not forgive others for theirs? Verse 14, he continues, And above all, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. As he's done elsewhere in his letters, Paul's just kind of bottom lining everything. If you want to remember one thing, he says, put on love. And, and Paul then links love to three other things that that will lead to peace, unity, and thankfulness. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Th there might be a battle for supremacy in our hearts. Let peace win over conflict. Let peace win over anger. Let peace win over strife. In what ways might you be able to bring peace into your home? And then he says, to which you indeed were called in one body. And Paul here is talking about the unity of the body, of the followers of Christ. And as I was thinking about this passage, I had to think back in my own life on the conversations that we've had after church while our kids are sitting in seats behind us in their car seats. And there were times where normally we would hopefully kind of talk about the message, ask what the kids learned in, in Sunday school, and, and try to make it appropriate for them. But I'll tell you, there was probably a lot of times when our kids sat back there and what they heard was, man, it took a long time to get out of the parking lot. I don't know why the pastor went so long. To be honest, it wasn't even that great of a message. I didn't like that song, that's not my favorite music. Any number of things that we can complain about. And I wonder with our kids listening back there, are we painting for them a picture, a consumer mentality that church is about what we get out of it, not about our participation in it? I, I wonder if we get critical and never satisfied with church and fellow believers, should we be surprised when our kids grow up and find no value 
in going themselves. Guys, the church is the bride of Christ. And it's a community that we're called to be active participants in. I've got this little, um, I don't know, thing, thing that kind of bothers me sometimes, but it would be really weird to try to change all of culture. But oftentimes we'll say, I attend Woodman Valley Chapel, which is true. But man, I wish we could say, I am Woodman Valley Chapel. We are the body of Christ. You are the church. Let's try to find ways that we can build each other up and demonstrate to our kids the incredible, diverse beauty of the body of Christ. Paul now does a little shift as he gets into verse 16. And he starts getting into some specific instruction, not just character traits that we should amplify or exemplify, but some specific things that we can do. And he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. The word of Christ should dwell, should live in us richly. We meet the sovereign God of the universe in the pages of scripture. And so parents, it's our responsibility to teach our kids about the word of God, about his truth, about doctrine, practical, godly counsel that is found in the pages of scripture. Now, I want to take a minute and talk to fathers. Because we see in scripture that fathers are called to be the spiritual head of the household. And so that is a unique role that I I think men have. And it's not to say that that our wives shouldn't be leading kids or moms shouldn't be leading kids because, man, they do a great job of that. But, But guys, we actually are the ones that are supposed to be leading the charge. Now, you might say, I haven't been a Christian as long as my wife. I, I, I don't know some of the things that she knows. She's a better teacher. That may be fine, but you should still be the leader, the instigator, the one that is encouraging the spiritual growth of your kids. And one of the ways that we should be doing our spiritual growth, I, I think, is, is just in some of the small areas. Now, you know, it, it would be great if we all took our kids to mini seminary. In fact, a lot of churches do that, different traditions. They have a catechism where you teach your kids about doctrine. You teach your kids uh, about the grand story of narrative, the grand narrative of scripture. And I think that's a really good idea, by the way. But, but I think what Paul's getting at, what, what I'm talking about, is just kind of the, the culture in your home. Kind of like if you're going to read books, you might as well read scripture. You might as well read books that reaffirm the things that you believe. Maybe read biographies of Christians. Same thing goes for our entertainment choices, our movies, TV shows, the music we watch, what is playing while we're cooking dinner on the radio. Looking for those small moments to continue to enforce the truth of God's word into our family so that our kids, it's just a natural part of their life. In verse 17, Paul says, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Just in case Paul missed anything specific, makes it really clear, whatever you do, do everything in the name of Jesus. We are not Christ followers sometimes, and as you probably guess, kids tend to be around you an awful lot when you're parenting, and so we want to be consistent, consistent in what we value and how we live these things out in our home. Jesus cannot just be an ancillary thing that we do on the weekends. So how can we have this posture of doing everything in the name of the Lord? There's three times these last couple of verses where Paul has said, be thankful Have thankfulness in your hearts or give thanks. I think being thankful is, again, only possible when we realize what Jesus has done for us. And so you need to find ways to remind yourself, to remind your kids to be thankful for his mercy and his grace. You know, several years ago, our our family did a little exercise where we decided to develop a family crest. And so we got all the kids together and we had some exercises and we were brainstorming what are the the things that we want to be true of our family. And then what were the images that would go into our crest and and what was our model that we would all have as our rallying cry. And and we ended up with just a three-word motto. And it was pray, love, and move. Pray because we want to be a family that that prays. Prays for each other, prays for our world, prays, prays for our friends. That we go to God first when we get into trouble. And love. We want to serve others. We want to be known as a loving family, a family that cares for others. 
And move was one that's maybe a little bit odd, but, but for us what that meant is we don't want to be satisfied just sitting in the basement chilling and having a good time and living for ourselves. We want to be moving and active and take risks and look for ways that we can live out our faith in the world. Now, I share this with you not because we're some great spiritual family doing amazing, wonderful things, but this might be an exercise that you want to do in your family. What is the culture and the tone that you want to set for your family? What's that family model that you want to live out? What is the spirit in your home? What do you want your family, what do you want your kids to be known for? Paul's given us a lot of practical direction on just how to do that. And so how do we actually seek the things of the, of the heavens? How do we seek the things of the Lord over the things of the world? I think it really comes down to two different things. We, we model and we train. And again, while our focus has largely been on parents, I think we can all live these things out. People are watching you, whether you're a parent or not, and how you live your life does speak volumes to what you believe. So what do we model? We model the behaviors that we want our kids to adopt. They are watching, they are emulating, so we model kindness and humility, meekness, patience, and we practice forgiveness. We model a love for God's word. We look for everyday opportunities to weave his word into our normal family practices. We make sure our kids understand the grand narrative of scripture, the full gospel, that our kids understand that God is a sovereign God of the universe who spoke and created everything. And of everything that he created, humanity was his pride and joy, the crown jewel of creation. And yet he gave humanity the choice to follow him or to choose what they felt was right and good and do their own thing. And so from those first humans all the way up until today, we continue to choose the things that we want to do over the things of God. And that is called sin. And that sin is a mortal wound. Sinful beings cannot live in the presence of a just and holy God. And so we have a problem. God loves us and yet we are separated by our sin. And the amazing, beautiful, wonderful thing is that he sent his son, Jesus, to die in our place, to pay the penalty for our sin, so that we could be reconciled with God for all of eternity. Make sure your kids know that. Not only do we model the things that we want our kids to see, but we actively train them. We lead them away from the things that the world values and point them towards godly values. We discourage selfish ambition and we seek to cultivate generosity and humility. We discourage anger and we cultivate forgiveness. We discourage negativity and we cultivate joy. Parents, let's put the work in to strengthen the core. Amen? Father God, I, I do thank you for the wisdom in your word. And Father, we see so clearly that there are these two paths, this path that leads to life and following you and this path that leads to death that way too often our culture or even our sinful hearts wants to pursue. Father, I, I want to pray for those parents who feel like they are failures, like they have tried, they have blown it, and they want to go back and rewind and do things over. And Father, I can certainly relate to that. Father, I pray that you would bring them comfort and encouragement and let them know that you are still at work, that you love their kids and you are at work in their lives. And even when we've blown it and we haven't done it perfectly, Father, that you are still on the job working on their behalf. And Father, if there are some things that, that come to mind that we can put into our family and weave into our, our family the spirit, the culture of our own family, Father God, would you just inspire us, put that thing in our mind right now that, that is going to be different when we get home. And Father, I just pray that we would remember our identity in you, that you paid the ultimate price so that we could be your children so that we could be reconciled with you. And so, Father, help us to never forget that we are your image bearers and help us to exemplify you in all that we do. We pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Would you stand with us as we sing one final song together?
Welcome the children, you stop for the word. We want to see people the way Jesus does. Your kingdom is simple, Lord, teach it to us. Your kingdom is humble, as humble. the Savior who gave his last breath. So may we die daily, our pride laid to rest. His kingdom is humble, the broken all blessed. is coming, and your kingdom is here, alive in our waiting, and at work in our tears, come to us quickly, and forever our prayer, your kingdom is coming, Lord Jesus come near, so hallelujah. be your name. May we live out that praise. That's every day at home, right? Unfortunately, it's not every day at home probably for those of us that are parents. Uh, it's not always God's kingdom that reigns. It's 
Jim's kingdom that reigns or mom's kingdom that reigns. You know, if there's feelings of failure as a parent, that can be a heavy weight that trails along in life, maybe long past a child growing up and leaving the home. Maybe as a child, looking back, you know, um, that behavior, um, that rebellion against parents, that can be that heavy weight too. But I think it's so important. We need to be forward-looking, upward-looking at these things that Kurt laid out for us. There's peace, there's hope. We can, we can live that out starting now. We can live that out today, to, tomorrow. Um, begin to make those differences. Lay those things before the Lord and ask Him to make those priorities, those behaviors, those attitudes, deep desires of our heart. If you would like prayer for your week ahead, the week behind, what it's going to be like to go home and parent or what it's going to be go, like to go home and be under parenting, um, we're going to have pastors and leaders up front. We would love to pray for you today. If you're new, we're glad you're here. We have Connect Central out through the doors and to the left. We'd love to just hear a little bit more, give you a chance to hear more about us here at Woodman. But before you go into your weekend, let me share this doxology, speak it over you. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to pre present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.